forward. And I'm gonna turn all of it on. There we go, okay. So it's about a six or seven second delay as we get going here. Um, but those of you that are just tuning in now, welcome to Still Growing in Grace, um, uh, kind of a weekly program of uh, growing in, in our knowledge and understanding of God's amazing love. None of us have arrived. That's why it's called Still Growing in Grace. And I've got Brad Jerzak here uh, from out west, Western Canada. So uh, I believe you're in Abbotsford, are you? That's right. Good. So I met, I met Brad a couple of years ago uh, in a coffee shop in Abbotsford, I think it was, because I was out to meet, uh, um, oh, what's his name the, at the monastery? Archbishop Lazar? Yes. Oh, good. So I had, uh, had a tour and uh, had the pleasure of meeting him. Um, wise guy. I really like him. Not a wise guy, but a wise. <laughs> Oops. So anyway. He's a sage, that's for sure. Yes, that's a good way to put it. So this morning, um, my goal is to uh, have a conversation with Brad, or Brad, I want to have a conversation with, with you about this ongoing stress of COVID. Um, I don't know about you, but I've been watching the news, and I am so um, frustrated and uh, probably exhausted. Fatigued is a good word from... Um, all the negativity coming from pol politics in both Canada and the United States. Um, that now the masking stuff, everybody's complaining about, Hey, you're, you're a masker. Well, then you're dumb or you're not a masker. So you're dumb. And, and, and then we call ourselves Christians. <laughs> like I'm, I'm having a really hard time because when people are posting, they don't leave a single iota bit of room for uh, they may be wrong mindset, right? There's, it's absolute. And so I want to kind of talk about how can we get our minds, um, uh, take every thought captive. And I'd like to have a conversation with you. And then by the end of our conversation, I want to make sure I give you time to talk about this book that's coming out or is out. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Give us the title of it now and then I'll come back to you and tell us what it's about later. It's a novella, which means a short novel by Paul Young, who wrote The Shack and I, and it's called The Pastor, A Crisis. Okay. And it's a work of fiction that does involve composite characters from real life so all the characters names have been changed to protect the true identities <laughs> well and in, and by composite i mean one character may be coming from six different people's stories oh yeah uh, you know but these it's rooted in, enough in reality um that the graphic nature of it is is actually authentic and gives us a chance for overt healing as well we'll come back to that but yeah good yeah here here we are in 2020 someone called it uh you know we'll think of this as the pandemic year well hopefully year singular but uh mm. <laughs> yeah well one thing that i've uh um heard and this is a better way to view it if you want to learn how to think more positive is to call it the year of the pause you know yeah. and yeah. i thought that that's a really um, wise way to perceive it because otherwise you're going to take it from the negative view and we're already getting that from our media from for those who are on Facebook or social media uh, I'm getting exhausted by it all and I want some good news what about you yeah I do too I would say maybe to get to the good news we would need to do some sorting mm. between the reality that of some people's actual circumstances right uh, so i would i would not want to spin the fact that some people have become sick and died and or mm -hmm. have lost loved ones as a result of covid that's real yeah and second some people are enduring actual financial hardship and layoffs from jobs and wondering if they're going to get evicted that's real yeah so on, on that side, uh, the reality of suffering, how, to, how can we come as faith people, as Jesus way people uh, into that? Because our faith shouldn't just only work during good times. When it, you know? So when we're facing um, a real sickness, fatality, or bankruptcy, or whatever, it, is there a word of hope for those people? But then the other side, and I think we, we need to separate this away is we're a lot of us are suffering from our narrative and we're we're telling ourselves a story 
that generates real anxiety and and we're letting others tell a story that feeds that in fact we may think we want to be free from this obsessive anxiety meanwhile we're addicted to the information overload on social media and television and i'm like well do you want to be free or not because i have some radical ideas about how to deal with that but one so one example would be um you know and then this works in terms of my own healing team when i when i've been working work through healing i realized i had too many voices and i needed to narrow the scope of those voices mm -hmm. So that they were all encouraging and all in agreement, um, but also all honest. And that meant instead of having a bombardment of voices, I'm like, okay, who are the people I will actually listen to on this? And I can just turn off the rest. In fact, I literally canceled my news cable service. Mm. Um, but what I can do is I can follow, I believe Bonnie Henry, that's our, uh, the British Columbia head doctor. I believe she's shown neither paranoia, paranoia, uh, nor bravado. She doesn't. She doesn't make me afraid. She gives me clarity. And I'm like, okay, that's a voice I can listen to. Mm -hmm. And then another voice I can listen to are what are the actual instructions on stores I go to. And if they say wear a mask, wear wear your mask. And yeah. And if, if they don't, um, what does Christ say? Well, you know, love your neighbors. As yeah, yourself. but they're trying to control you, Brad. <laughs> yeah. Um, I so figured that word's going to come up, right? That's a narrative. And I'm like, what is the fruit of listening to that? Mm -hmm. Well, one, one fruit is I get afraid. And another fruit is I get defiant. Mm. Fear and defiance have nothing to do with being a Christian disciple. Mm -hmm. So the narrative of control is bearing itself out as false through the, f the bad fruit of either fear or defiance. And I'm just, I'm watching it. I don't, I'm not afraid. Um, and, but I'm also not defiant. I'm like, is it, is it control if, if someone asks me to put my seatbelt on? I guess so. <laughs> um, is, is you know, I don't need one now, but is it control if your partner asks you to wear a condom? You know, like, come on. <laughs> so, um, so I think you can go into deep into paranoia around either the control factor or, but, but I, just, I just think a lot of that has to do with exalting my rights and my way above basic love of neighbor without mm. fear so i went to a 12-step meeting last night we met outdoor in a park we met face to face six feet apart yep. um and we had an incredible connection time and we self-regulated i think that's part of it too is like i don't mind self-regulating but don't tell me what to do it's like well okay, <laughs> then, um, don't tell me what to do sounds a lot like adam and eve in the garden you know so that's one that's one angle. Um, so just to review what I've said so far, it's like I, I, would dis, I would distinguish between the real hardships people are experiencing and how to face those, and then the kind of narratives that we feed off of um, that actually exacerbate the anxiety. Yeah. And that's a decision, actually. I'm not just undergoing anxiety. I'm not, uh, it's, if you want control, turn off your TV and unplug from social media. That'll give you control. But no, who wants to do that, right? Uh, <laughs> don't tell me what to do. <laughs> okay. It's, it's funny how it. the, <laughs> it's funny how the don't tell me what to do is under an underlying thought for a lot of stuff going on right now, yeah. you know, uh, and not just in the COVID world. I'm talking the church world, you know, when, uh, you have some folks who have come into a neat revelation of God and now they polarize their new revelation with what they used to believe. I've done this. Um, that is now wrong and this is now right. And so we have these two right and wrongs that we declare and we're, we're so excited about the new right that we just bash the wrong and forget there are people 
that are still there that see it maybe a little differently. And there's, there's an ungracious approach. And it's the wrong approach, I think, the, from the wrong tree, the tree of the knowledge of right and yeah. wrong, good and I evil. I was thinking the same thing. It's still, you're still at the same tree then, right? Wrong tree, exactly. So I've also heard some uh, conflicting words are that uh, when we there's not there's nothing to do with submission here when we submit you know it's not the right terminology for submitting to the rules but i i think it is i think when we submit to christ we surrender all of our rights in my in my mind i see it as i yield to those in front of me i just finished reading love is patient love is kind at a funeral yesterday and realized agape is other centered so if I'm other centered all the time, then I am reflecting Christ in me. When I am saying, no, I want this self-seeking, that's no longer agape. It's probably eros or something. I don't know. Yeah, I think you're exactly right. The, um, so you've just, you used a cluster of really powerful words there. So submission, surrender, and yielding. All of those words describe kenosis which is other-centered, self-giving love. Kenosis is the very nature of God's love. It's, in, in other words, it, um, Christ emptied himself for the sake of others to demonstrate the Father's love to us. And he, he shows us what that looks like in the Garden of Gethsemane when he yields to, uh, um, for the sake of others, even when it means facing suffering. Hmm. Um, and so if Christ had gone into my will be done in the garden of Gethsemane, we'd all be damned, hmm. you know? And so I hear you calling us into very basic Christ-likeness. The transfiguration of empowering grace generates, um, generates an, a, a, a humble attitude of yielding. And you just can read it in, in Philippians chapter two. And it's like, if, um, so if even if our right theology, our identity in Christ um, and all of that uh, generates pride rather than humility, defiance rather than submission, um, then, then we're not being empowered by grace. We're being empowered by a modernistic worldview that says your autonomy is the highest moral value. And mm -hmm. we call that freedom. <laughs> That's not freedom. Um, that's that it's that freedom is a euphemism there for self-will and self-will is is the um that's what got us in the predicament in the first place mm -hmm. so so willfulness versus willingness and yeah so i really resonate with what you're saying i've uh I've had to bite my tongue at times uh, in grocery stores when people aren't distancing, they aren't following the lines. Cause I give me the rules and it's easy to follow when there are no rules. Everybody has an opinion. So I'm in my region, they've made a rule. You must wear the mask. And so uh, okay, I thought, great, that'll reduce the fighting. Well, actually raised the anxiety in one sense for those who are not. And so I forgot that I also need to be loving to those who are either unaware whether intentionally or unintentionally and um, and not be so quick to snap, you know, Hey, you see the line, hey, hey, hey. you know, like I, it's hard. And uh, cause I, I, I like everybody doing the same thing. Cause then it's, it's, there's peace in everybody following the current guidelines for safety. Right. But yeah. um, then I just realized, how do, how, do we, how do we push back against the accusation that, that you know, that, oh, well, that's the law and I don't need, you know, grace take, puts me beyond the law. <laughs> oh, please. Oh, my goodness. Listen, Brad, that drives me nuts. Uh, I had a, I'm teaching identity in Christ a couple of years ago at my church. And people, uh, some people, some people walked out and called me legalistic because I talked about laws. But I don't see the, the law of the life of Christ rules us. There's still the law of the life of Christ. But the law that most people are referring to are the rules you must keep in order to maintain or get rightness with God. That, right. That's done. That's old covenant. The new covenant is the law of life, which swallows up the old covenant in its intent, not in its micro or macro rules, but it's now the person. So 
to say it's we're above the law? No, 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 no. We're actually, if you want to read a little further, it says submit then to the governments around you. Pay your taxes. Come on. You know, um, that, that's a big point. And there's some people who are militant about that. Well, we're pretty selective to, to be <laughs> honest, right? I'll, of course. I'll obey it if it's to my benefit. And maybe, yes. may, maybe that is a way in. I, I remember hearing someone preaching on the Ten Commandments and how, you know, um, the Sermon on the Mount, it, it'll grab a few of those ideas, but it's, it, he fulfills it in the sense of, that, well, how is this about love, right? So mm. I, if you think about yourself as the beneficiary, it's, what did they call that? Enlightened self-interest. But he's like, how would you like to live in a society where you know no one will ever kill you? No one will ever steal from you. No one will ever cheat on your spouse with your spouse on you. No one would ever lie to you. No one. Oh, that'd be nice. It's like, well, I'm just describing the Ten Commandments from the viewpoint of, uh, of, of love. If I, if I'm the beneficiary. Mm -hmm. So how would we, you know, how would you like a, um, how would you like to live in a society where no one carrying the virus ever comes within six feet of you and coughs on you. Would that be okay? That'd be awesome. <laughs> you know, um, but, but what, then when we say, well, if I want that for me, then maybe I could have the love of God in me for love of your neighbor as yourself, have a little empathy here. Um, Is it possible that, go ahead. Is it possible people don't love themselves and that's why they can't love others like that? Do you think that might play a role in that? Maybe. I'm thinking that not loving ourselves can still look very selfish, right? So at the heart of it, maybe we don't, you know, maybe there's a kind of self-loathing. Maybe we can't empathize with others because we don't love ourselves. Um, uh, but that's, that could still look like very selfish behavior. Mm -hmm. right? So so I, I do um, I, I do think it can be more than just like a defensive posture too against COVID. We could say, oh, all right, so now what an incredible opportunity to demonstrate love for others, not only in the sense of don't cough on them and wear your mask, but it's like I, I, I am surprised at some of the beautiful ways I'm seeing people help each other. Mm -hmm. And in fact, new connections being formed. So for example, on my cul-de-sac before, before this crisis, I didn't know everybody's name. Uh, on my, my little cul-de-sac, mm -hmm. I've lived here 15 years and I couldn't tell you all the children's names. There's only 10 houses or 12 houses. I didn't, and here's the reality, I didn't care about our alienation. Ouch. And now I kind of do. And the weirdest thing happened. Um, my, uh, I ended up started starting to learn their names and then, and then the Lord uh, made an opportunity where my fence was rotting and falling down. And now the neighbor couple next door and I went halves on getting a guy to come in and, and fix our fence. And it's like, but you're going to have to move the fence. So now we're working together mm -hmm. and out of gratitude that he set the whole thing up. My wife's like, well, let's have, let's have a social distancing supper together on our deck. And I, wow. like, 15 years into this, I finally actually, you know, am connecting. So there's a way of turning the disconnect in, in, mm. and into a commitment against alienation. And maybe on a broader scale, even the defiance about social distancing, which we never minded before. Now it's enforced <laughs> on us. Now maybe That's we're funny. energized to connect in healthy ways. It doesn't have to be in toxic ways. It could be healthy ways. All the, inter all the introverts were saying, we've been trying this for years. Come on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, um, and so I do think reset, what did you call it? A year of pause. For me, it's been a real reset in terms of what, what practices have I begun that I'd like to make permanent now? Hmm. And also, what things did I stop doing that I think I'm going to stop doing forever. Mm. And that's, that's one way to come at it. And in both of those cases, it feels like new opportunities, new freedom. Yeah, that, that's cool. I know in the, 
in the church world, because I'm, I'm a pastor and we had to shut down our public services and we're just beginning to plan reopening sort of in a safe way. And um, there are some churches that are being militant about, nope, God's going to protect us. We're going to have our meetings anyway, blah, blah, blah. The state can't tell us what to do. The province can't tell us what to do. And all those non-Christ <laughs> responses or the anti, I think they're, they're not a reflection of Christ. Um, that's creating anxiety as well. And I think it's also changing the way church functions or, or even what is the church anymore um, or what it wasn't is now being revealed. Yeah. Like, wow. I, ouch. <laughs> yeah. What it wasn't is being re- now being revealed. We just had, I just got back. We've been doing zoom kind of church, which, um, I, I'm glad that we there was upsides. We saw people showing up more regularly than they had when it was in person, right? They thought they were regular attenders once a month, and now they're on every every week. So that's pretty cool. But there's something missing when it's not flesh. You know, yes. the word was not made digital. The word was made flesh. Yep. So last week I got to the monastery. Um, we had oh, we had a slightly larger than average attendance. But we met outside, again, social distancing. And here's the thing to warn you about, Mike. Um, we had to work out how are, how are we going to gather in the unity of faith around Jesus Christ before the fearful are unafraid and before the defiant are undefiant. So in other words, we had very scared people who dared to show up. We had very defiant people who strutted their way in and were like, how can we live together when we're, when, when we, when we haven't yet let go? Did you talk about that? Yeah. um, Well, it was weird. It felt like it was, it felt like the leadership led by example. So, but, and also we had a real, to get in, you had to have your temperature taken. You had to wash your hands. You had to sign your name, your phone number, and get yep. a ticket that yep. would give you a number that for the RCMP if they needed it. Um, so there was a lot of there was, and I think some people were rolling their eyes. And there were the rules, and it's like you must must wear a mask and all of that. Then we got into the space, the outdoor space where the service was, and some people just wouldn't, they wouldn't wear their masks, but they were good about keeping their distance. They're like, I have convictions about masks, but I know you're, if you're worried, I'm not gonna make you worried about me. Mm-hmm. And then um, we, I really noticed even myself, I was watching, for examples, is the priest putting on a mask? When does he put on the mask? When does he take off the mask? Um, we do sing. Oh, singing's scary. How do we sing? So it was weird because... Let's hum that third verse one more time. <laughs> okay. yeah. And so I found for myself, I, I, I would make sure that when I was on my... If I could be socially distanced and I wasn't singing, I could pull my mask down at least below my nose. Mm-hmm. And then when I w- if I went to sing, I would make sure I'm facing in a direction where there's no people. And I put my mask on for the singing and st- yeah. stuff like that. Yep. Anyway, what... So what was going on there? It's partly, partly I was taking a cue from, from the priest that um, um, I'm not afraid, but I'm going to take care of my brothers and sisters, even in their fear, but I'm not going to belittle those who, who aren't wearing a mask. Um, but I will make boundaries if I need to. Mm-hmm. And I have enough authority there that I, that I could do that. And if I saw someone being unsafe, I, I would say, let's love our brothers. I know you don't want to wear a mask, but, but I didn't have to do that. So why did that, why did it work? Well, I think it was because of fa- it was a family, but it, I could feel it. You had the full polarization within the people. Okay. And it's like, can love transcend the polarization? And I, it did for us, I, but I think you'd have to manage it. 
Yeah, leadership matters. Uh, everywhere I where I see um, it not being safe, it's all about the leadership every single time. I'm trying to do every due diligence, make sure we have disinfecting stuff done. I bought a special fogging machine, a misting machine to disinfect on contact, which will reduce all the labor of wiping down. It's a smart, smart way to go. Um, yeah. But that's one Sorry. category. Mississauga, the, the Greek Orthodox Church there, I saw photos of that too. Yeah, the, the spraying, it's like, yep. okay. Absolutely. There's a way to do it and give security and sense of peace to your congregants to know, hey, they're doing a good job. They're doing due diligence. So that's, that's good. Like we're, we're learning. What, do you have some thoughts on, on the ways we can um, work with those who really are having hardship? So, so a lot of what we've talked about is mindsets of fear or defiance yep. Yep. Um, that, that you confront by a new narrative we're not afraid, but love guides us or something like that. But mm -hmm. for those who, who really are, are and, and it's not just getting COVID as an illness problem. I, I have a friend who's waiting for, for um, heart surgery. But because of the COVID crisis, the wait is extra long being extended. So here's a guy who doesn't have coronavirus, but he kind of does in that sense, right? Mm -hmm. And also those who have been laid off and now perhaps may even be evicted. Uh, do we have a word of hope for them? Who, when you so figure that out, let me know. So. <laughs> That's a hard one because um, it, it might require us to peel back yet another layer of selfishness. As long as my family is secure and I've got my income, bank account's fine, I'm secure for the next six months. Um, okay, good. Oh, I'm so sorry to hear about your problem. Oh my goodness. And do nothing about it. Right. That's, again, I, I, that's a, a really important category. And this goes with the depth of knowing we're beloved. Right. If you don't think you're loved, then you're still trying to get, right? Still trying to protect, self-protect. But when we know we are fully loved, accepted, and liked by God, um, then we start to see others centered. Then agape starts to have its fruit coming out. And God will put people in your mind. Say, hey, please send them 500 bucks. Send them 100. Drop off groceries. Mow their lawn for them. You know, whatever. Um, it's we have one couple who, who runs an Airbnb and... Uh you know, they've put that on suspension so that they can have a, they, they've invited a family into their Airbnb. Now, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, <clears throat> it pushes back against our culture, but you know, at, in the end of Acts 2 and up to chapter 4, you're, you're finding out there were no poor among them <clears throat> because they were sharing everything they had. Mm -hmm. Well, when we've read that up till this year, that seemed quite voluntary, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but what, what was going on, and this happened during the um, 16th century for sure too, is that Christ prophesied that during times of persecution, your homes would be confiscated. Now in that case, it was by, you know, let's say governing authorities. But what if your home is confiscated by coronavirus through an eviction? Hmm. And what, what they discovered was that they had everything in common when people started living together. And what they noticed in the Anabaptist um, movement in the early 1500s is when actually Catholic or Reformed authorities confiscated their homes. Um, what did they do? It's like, well, come live with us. There is absolutely no... Eviction should not be a problem in a church community. Now, if you're, if you're like post-church, you may be screwed. <laughs> but <laughs> if you're still in a faith family, mm -hmm. I just don't see how anybody in a faith family could lose their home and have nowhere to sleep that night. That's he, that was even, even deconstructionists have moved to a, like a, a, a group fellowship instead of a church building, right? So they're still fellowshipping. It's I hope not, so. Yeah. Yeah. It's not about the institution at all. Um, uh, Keith Giles, I think, does a really good job of that. He's got a, a house church that he connects with. In fact, you and him talked about, I think it was Sermon on the Mount. Was that you and him? Yep. Yeah, that was really good. Um, but there's, there was a, there's a sense of community that's required. And unfortunately, when you said you're screwed, 
I think there's a lot of believers who have made zero effort in connecting with others, even in a church, you know, they, they're more about, Hey, why are my needs not being met? But they're not putting effort into relationships. Suddenly when push comes to shove, a crisis comes, death comes, then why isn't the church loving me? You know, there's, there's still about take, 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 and they're not giving mutually freely into relationship time, which is where the seeds of connections are and communication, by the way. Yeah. Can't read well, their minds. I sure hope I'm not tested on it because I don't, I, I don't, like, I don't know. <laughs> I, but but you, you're making efforts in relationships. Now it's in your cul-de-sac. That's yeah. a new church, <laughs> you know? But this the idea of we're not alone, but we're actually one with each other, including people who don't believe what we believe, we're still one with them. Yeah. yeah. Oh my goodness. If you see the separation, then of course you don't care about helping. Right. Wow. The delusion of separation. And Absolutely. Gee, and who, who's torment. taught on that before? <laughs> yeah. And the abs, and then the, and then, and then how that creates a reality of alienation. When yeah. you believe the delusion of separation, you begin to live out a, a, the alienation. And that's why, that's why I think this could be a great moment for, mm. the, for people like us where we're like, I, didn't care enough about the alienation before and now I'm starting to care about it and okay what what what, what decisions will I make about that that's true I'm going to go back up to uh, I'm starting to take a look at some of the notes here we're getting some comments online Catherine Toon calls it the year of up, up upgrades so this is a year of upgrading and I like how you you talked about um, think through some of the patterns or behaviors that I've stopped doing and I'll just, that's it. I'm not bringing them back in or here's the new habits. Um, this requires in, uh, introspection. Does it not? Does it, or at least or even better contemplation, right? Yeah. So the upgrade, the spiritual upgrade that nobody is prevented from having, even if you get sick, even if you get laid off, not only will you have an opportunity to upgrade into a contemplative way of thinking about the world of, of prayer of your spirituality not only an opportunity but but it's like virtually a requirement and it's wonderful where um i i want to say prayer but it's bigger than that mm -hmm. Contem contemplative life living means being my uh, like you said, there's an introspection involved, there's, but it's also a way of seeing the world, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, what would it look like for our, our prayer lives and our broader lives to be more contemplative? To me, that's a, that, that's a big topic, but it, that's a serious upgrade. Yeah, and a required one, but nobody wants to slow down enough to, to even consider it. <laughs> yeah. And then, so for some, now they have to. Yes, well, <laughs> that's... that's you're right. This is forcing a change that everybody thinks is all evil. Something's happening. Well, wait a minute. It can look like that, but what will the fruit of all this be? What are we going to learn? Families are spending time together. Some couples that we're going to be breaking up are no longer breaking up, although other couples are now breaking up. Like there's, there's a vicious cycle of this. I, uh, I want to read one quick quote that Keith um, Giles wrote. He said, your rights are where love goes to die. Paul Young wrote that. And by the way, Paul Young, um, last Thursday in, in, the, in this uh, Still Growing Grace episode, shared with us that six of his family members have COVID and three of them are really sick. So there's somebody we know with loved ones facing this. So yeah, in our case, um, my wife's mother passed away um, indirectly through COVID in that she had, she had um, advanced dementia. When COVID hit, it shut down the place where she was living and her husband could no longer see her every day. Wow. Well, he, he couldn't see her at all. And she's cut off and confused and she just shut down and died within two weeks. Yep. Then we couldn't have a funeral. Yep. So we tried to do a little social distancing graveside, but the grief in my father-in-law when we couldn't even hug him, you know, it, mm -hmm. you're like, Oh my goodness. Um, and, and we're like, but we want to hug him. It's important. But it's like, wait a minute, are we willing to lose him? You know, if, if one of us is carrying and so, yeah, so it really hit us, but. So how would you, how would you address the question? How do we guard our thoughts during this time? Um, we never got to the deconstruction stress yet. We may, we, I don't know if we'll have time, but we'll see. But to guard our thoughts in this, how would you speak or share with somebody 
that's really anxious. I don't know what to do. I'm really worn out now. I just want to shut off everything. What would you, you know? I'm a big 12 step fan. So step three is my solution to this. And step three is how I have to live daily. And step three is what I had to work on with a sponsor on this last Sunday morning. Cause I was freaking out about my son's move. Um, step three is my, is my gospel invitation. Here it is. Uh, we made a decision to, and I, I used to hate that. It's like evangelicals always talk about making a decision and, <laughs> but now I'm seeing, I, I have been making decisions that lead to debilitating anxiety. Wow. There was a why in the road at some point where I could take the path into the life and light and, and love of God, or I could head down towards this gorilla of debilitating anxiety at that. Why I did make a decision. What, and what did that look like? So step three says we made a decision to surrender. So mm-hmm. there's kenosis. Yeah. There's the garden of Gethsemane. We made a s- decision to surrender to what? Uh, well, surrender what? Our will. Uh, so there's the self will problem and our lives. So my actual life, we made a decision to surrender our will and lives over to the care, not the control mm-hmm. the care of this loving God. And so, um, so what that meant for me practically is, and this, this is, has to be a daily prog- process. It has to be every time I'm, in, I'm confronted with fear or the threat of control or whatever. It's like I surrender. I surrender my will in my life. I surrender my finances to the care of God. I surrender my family. I surrender my sons my granddaughter to the Mm -hmm. care of a God who I know loves me and who is in fact good. And here's a strange thing. Um, The way that 12 steppers think about this is my job is not to change the world around me. You can't, that's control. Mm -hmm. My job is to, is, is to clean my own house, my heart. And the way I do that is through surrender. But here's the wonderful, ironic thing. It's a little bit like that, you know, Eckhart Tolle's um, law of attraction, except his is so depersonalized that, uh, but this is, this is, maybe it's even a counterfeit. I don't know. But here it is for us um, that when I surrender my, my, my life and my will over to the care of this loving God without trying to manipulate my circumstances, the world actually responds Mm. like, well, first of all, God responds, but also people respond differently to me when they meet a yielding surrendered loving person who has faith that God is good and loves me. They actually, that does attract a different Mm. circumstance. I'll give, I'll give you one uh, really a happy praise item about this you know um my circumstances i still have big glitches so i i my i have this wonderful coffee cup which i'm so careful to have a lid on and i kept i keep it i keep it a foot away it socially distances from my laptop (laughs) but it fell over a little while ago and when it fell over like it shot coffee it shot coffee out of the little hole into the corner of my keyboard and ruined my laptop and 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 like to find a reconditioned one of the same model that's five years old was going to be a thousand bucks that i'm like oh but but i have to surrender my life and my will and my circumstances to god it's like you know what you get to take care of me i guess i'm going to invoice god and let him work it out (laughs) i i did find i did find laptop for a thousand bucks the day i found it and ordered it I got an unexpected check for the same amount from a charity who usually is asking me for money out of the blue. And and they're like, yeah, we just thought what you're doing is important. They didn't know my laptop was right. The check arrived the same day. Um, Another friend um, said, called me. I I thought about this friend. I thought I'm going to, I should, he came to mind with gratitude. I thought I should reach out to him and just say, you came to mind with gratitude. I didn't reach out. The next day, we haven't talked in years. The next day he contacted me 
And he said, um, I, I said, that's weird. I just thought of you. He said, well, I thought of you every day this week. And I thought, um, I better call and ask if you have any needs I could help with. I'm like, actually, God's been covering my needs. But I do have this project, this novel, and we got to pay the printing fee. And I probably need $15,000 that, you know, I don't know, maybe I'll go take a loan or mortgage my house. Or, and he goes, well, what if I give you an interest-free loan payable only if you get the money back from the book? Wow. I'm like, what? Twist my arm. <laughs> yeah and and people so people ask me like how does that happen to you well it doesn't happen to me all the time sometimes i have to bite the bullet and i tighten yeah. my belt but what i do know is this when i surrender my life and will to the care of a loving god who i know has my back yep. um this world somehow because love permeates every atom of the universe responds to the responds with the love of god all creation groans and waits for, for us to participate. So it's not the thing of um, uh, all things work together for good, as in everything will work out in the end. That's not what it means. Correct. All things are working together. Mm. You're working with your brothers and sisters in Christ and with your neighbor and with the animals in your neighborhood and with every atom in the universe that emanates the love of God. All that begins to work together for for the good of, of your city and your culture. So well, that's amazing. If, how do you tap into it through surrender? Through yielding? Right. Because you're saying that, but I know for certain somebody's going to immediately think I want your fruit. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. You can I, have it. I want Go your fruit every day. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what it's, it's, it's the overrunning the base uh, of the, okay, what do I need to do? But they're always thinking to get that. I want that. They're, they're overthinking uh, a conditional surrender. Right. It's getting then, right? Yes. With, and getting, another word for getting, it, it's the spirit of grasping. Uh, so Adam and Eve were already like God. Yeah. Right? They were made in the image of God. The serpent comes along and says, if you would just grasp at that tree, then you could be like God. Mm. So now they're grasping to get what they already are. Philippians 2, though he was equal with God, he did not consider his equality a thing to be grasped. Mm. But instead, mm. letting go, yielding, surrendering, humbling himself. And so, yeah, you're exactly right. It's tricky because if it's about getting, so in both of the cases I just gave, I didn't, I didn't, not only did I, not grasp at it it didn't even come to my mind mm -hmm. that these people these kind people would reach out to me as i surrendered my financial needs to the care of a loving god and and sometimes the best thing for me is going without and god knows that too mm -hmm. this year uh will be 30 years i'll be married this october october 12th and Lori and i have great 2020 hindsight <laughs> And we have seen God take care of stuff and people ask how, well, I can't give them the menu or the, the to-do list because I know for me, this is, this is about surrender. There were times where I did the tithing mindset. There were times I did the surrender, but the, the point was we did trust God. We yielded our trust to him. Yeah. Even when it looks scary. In fact, I remember there were times I was horrifically afraid. Uh, in fact, we had just moved to Waterloo from Fort Erie and I, I was fearful, like in the middle of the night, I was, in fact, I did the Pentecostal thing. I went through my house and prayed all the demons out of every room and corner. I did, cause I had to hit that step just in case, cause I felt the, the pressure coming in. I couldn't sleep that night. Uh, Lori knew I was getting anxious and she said, is this grace stuff you're teaching true or not? Cause you're sure not showing it. It's like, Oh, why have they? Oh, it's please. True. Did you have your devotions today? Yeah. Anyway. Um, or worse, like how much should we give this person? Oh! <laughs> but the, she was right. Yep. And I had to do my huff and puff, but then realized completely within seconds. Yeah. I am, uh, I need to surrender this and trust God on this too. I'm trying to fantasy think in the future too much. I'm future tripping. 
when there's no room for that because God's not there. I think Paul talked about that last week, Paul Young. Um, the future tripping, you go and fantasize of a, a, an outcome that God's not there in that because that isn't real. Yeah. And so right here, right now, right in front of us. Yeah. You know, that, I thought that was pretty powerful last week. Yeah, I, I would want people to know that this is really true of both you and I, that we're, we're going on about surrender, not because that's our temperament, but because it's a required <laughs> repentance in our lives because we freak out. Yeah. And, and like I said, just on Sunday morning, I needed an hour to 90 minutes just on letting go of one thing, and I could not do it on my own. I needed yeah. a friend to come help me. And so I, it's like why I'm nonviolent. Not because I'm nonviolent, but because I am violent, and it's a call of repentance. Follow the way of Jesus, or you will, you you, you will do stupid things, right? Well, yeah. In the case of, meanwhile, um, yeah, God's really ble- we married up, didn't we? So my I married up. <laughs> I know that. <laughs> yeah, my, my wife's brilliant this way, and she's like, "So are you going to let this go? And what what decision are you making that's causing you to suffer so much? You know why you're suffering, and and I don't." how do I help you? Yeah. And, uh, and have you handed this over to God yet? It's like, shut up. You know, <laughs> no, I wouldn't say that to I'd, I'd be scared. No. <laughs> um, I know that in this COVID time, um, it has caused my wife and I to have more and deeper conversations. I've had more revealed about myself and how I have functioned over the 30 years. Um, she probably doesn't understand. I haven't talked to her about all this, um, but I know for me, I ha- I can see where I have tried to control circumstances and she just gives stuff up. No problem. She's just so free. Good grief. But I'm, I'm, I've been learning the last couple of months being home more, you know, how yeah. the house functions and me being there and it's, wow, I don't, I don't have to freak out about this. It doesn't have to be quite like this. Yeah. It's what if we, good. What, for those who are married or have families that are listening, uh, what if this, what if you decided that this will become the best part of your, the best part of your whole lifelong time in marriage? And um, what are you going to do? Yeah. And this, this is, and, and this has been, this is literally the best year marriage years of our lives, you know, this year, this year. So um, I saw a meme that is true of me. Um, 2020 is the, worst year I've ever seen it's not the worst year I've ever experienced mm. worst year as I ever experienced um, I would never want to go back to but right now we're we've gone through corrections in our marriage through corrections in my travel schedule i.e cancellations um, corrections <laughs> in our priorities and and the good fruit of that is beginning to happen even even in the hardest parts of it um, we're seeing God fill those things like grieving our mother, my mother-in-law, God, God is filling that up. Um, and we we've never had such good family connections, even around, um, <coughs> uh, around grieving her. And so the challenges themselves become opportunities for an upgrade in faith and trust hmm. and surrender. That's, that's working for us. And we're like, wow, I'm really sorry for those who are experiencing actual trauma. I get that. I don't want to dismiss that. I'm just saying um, this is, this is so far been a good year for us. And not only because it's got easier somehow Mm -hmm. in some ways, the ways it got harder have been a good, have been the worst thing that ever happened to you can become the best thing that ever happened to you. You know, any addict will tell you that. So, <laughs> well, I know that uh, mental uh, health is a really big deal uh, right now for a lot of people, and it's getting ramped up. I was at a uh, fire department uh, training event, um, and they had uh, professional counselors and therapists there. And one of the comments came out, and I wrote it down as soon as I heard it, because I knew this is, this is real. It's not about mental illness. It's about mental unawareness. Oh, I thought, you that, tell. Oh, yeah. That, that totally changed my thinking that these individuals are just not aware of something that may be more true. Um, and so when we, we see people with having mental anxiety, they're, 
it could very well be an unawareness of peace that's already in them because we know Christ's peace is in all things, in all people, yeah. but they're not aware of it. Yeah. So, and, and even for believers, we're not always aware. That's why the honesty of your story, my story, and, and all those, each person watching has their own story, um, being honest with it, you know, because when we're in this kind of a crisis, we need each other to talk through it and realize, ah, I'm not in this alone. They're having trouble too. Oh, okay. I thought I was the only one. I'm trying to be more spiritual here. No, 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 no. This is not about being more spiritual or, or trying to live up to a standard. This is about the now again. Yeah. Is Christ in front of you right now. This is the only thing that is true right now. That's really good. The kingdom of God is now. It's the only place it exists, actually. Yep. And in my, is letting go. In my sermon series that I'm doing now, uh, uh, it'll be two weeks now, um, but I'm dealing with uh, the topic of Nebuchadnezzar's dream of hope. And uh, because we got all these yahoos, let me rephrase that. I shouldn't say that. I'm trying to re word my terminology i just slipped i'm sorry um there are individuals who <laughs> christ abides in <laughs> that, <We> say yahoo <laughs> <laughs> well I, I said idiots i said idiots uh, over a uh, in a group and realized somebody called me on it right away and rightly so because that's my flippant response yeah yeah um but there are individuals that are hijacking this this pandemic as an end times fear mongering trip right and yet I see Nebuchadnezzar's dream and Daniel's interpretation of it as the kingdom has come and is growing and fills the whole earth. The, this, the gospel wins. Jesus wins. It's not a fearful time. And I think that is a picture of Christ coming at the time of the Roman empire. So when the rock comes and smashes the toes, dude, that's awesome. <laughs> so that, anyway, that's, that's what's coming in two weeks, but uh, it's time for hope. Enough of this negative news. I, I think the, if we sense the news we're hearing is creating a tightness and a, and a fear, it's not from Christ. Right. So I don't know. That's how we take thoughts captive, I guess. That's one way. Yep. I really so I, that. Yeah. So uh, do we have a, a couple more minutes? Uh, I, we're Maybe. not going to get into deconstruction stress. Maybe we can have another call. Uh, if you're a game, but we'll don't answer that live. We'll, we'll chat with that later, but okay. you, you've got a book coming out. Um, and uh, cause we've got like five minutes left. I don't want to take more of your time. Can you tell us about this cool book that I think you and Paul wrote or what's. Yeah. What's yeah. So, and it's really relevant to all of this because it's about, it's about a pastor who had been covering up some of his shameful past using projection, i.e. fundamentalism. Mm -hmm. um, and what happens is the book opens with him having a massive, implosion mm. and and so uh he's going to have to face his demons and work through um a healing journey if he's able in <laughs> my uh, my youngest son who is one of the voice actors in the audio version um he said he said dad this is a compliment this is an f up effed up version <laughs> of Dickens Christmas Carol complete with visitations and God bless us everyone. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so what it, what the book is about is it, it tracks, it tracks the journey of a man who, who is trying to, to live off of self will and pride, the clenched, the clenched fist of defiance and control. So all the things you would associate with a clenched fist, right? And then he has this massive crash that leaves him despondent and despairing. And in fact, it, it would be like um, uh, going from a clenched fist to a limp wrist, you know, just uh, of, of he's beaten, but, but is he beaten and left? Like, what will it take to let, how bad does it have to get for him to bottom out? And so um, bottoming out isn't just, as bad as it can get bottoming it out is when you flip your hands over into surrender. I've and, just, uh, I've just shared, go. I just shared the uh, pre-release uh, picture from your page. Yeah, here's a review from a friend of mine who just read it. impactful, transformative, riveting, graphic, disturbing, revealing. And <laughs> really uh, this, this story does reflect real lives who've experienced uh, abuse and have been abusers. Yep. Uh, it reflects people who have had this implosion and went through the hell that it takes to bottom out and to encounter healing love and forgiveness 
of self even. So that's, uh, and, and I'm, I'm just so grateful that Paul Young would partner with me in, in writing this because mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, he's such a generous, good guy and, and he was willing to uh, throw his energy into making what might've been a, a good book into a, something beautiful. Wow. I'm looking forward to seeing it. Uh, apparently September 1st, it's available in Canada in hard copy. Well, in fact, um, today I'm just working out if I can get you a link, there is a local bookstore in Canada called House of James. It's willing to do online sales before it hits the okay. official release date. Um, so I'll get you that link if you want to share that. At Absolutely. Point. They, it's, um, um, it's going to be out. It's hardcover Kindle and, and, um, by the first week in September, this audio book that is like a radio drama. We hired okay. professional actors wow. to, do the, to do the voices. So I think it's an important book for people in deconstruction, people in recovery, or people who care about others that want to walk them through to surrender to the care of a loving God. And uh, But it comes with trigger warnings because we're dealing with real life kind of trauma that um and so i know from your backstory mike i think you're going to be moved by what you see there because it in some ways uh, you'll resonate with parts of the journey hmm. okay thanks for the warning <laughs> yeah. i have a kleenex box ready but okay well the shack did that for me for sure i was a blubbering mess i went through one of those you know those little tiny packs of kleenex to keep in your pocket it was gone by the end of the screening yeah. Oh. He, uh, yeah. And even, you know, Paul, obviously, because Paul Young co-wrote the book, he's read it a bunch of times, but he listened to the audio version and he wept through the last hour of wow. it. And he just said, this is a, this is important. This could heal people. So. Well, I'm, I'm all about helping us grow and continue to grow. Uh, as I said at the beginning, like the reason I call this program still growing in grace is because none of us have arrived. I see a lot of ministry mindsets talk about arriving and this is, this is once you reach this step, ha ha, there you are, but it's more fluid, you know, yeah. it's taken so many years to unlearn that. So I'm, I look forward to another conversation sometime about deconstruction and reconstruction and, I'd love and to. yeah. Very cool. All right. I'm going to end the live stream, but if you can stay on for a moment, that'd be great. Um, you. Thank you everyone for watching and commenting. Sorry. I didn't, uh, I normally have ADHD. I can read the comments real fast, but there's some good friends that are chiming in. Catherine tunes there and Bill Thrasher and, and Kevin Shea and a few others. So, and Robert and Windsor. So, all right, that's it. I'm going to hit the uh, off button over here. Thanks again. Uh, share this link. I will re-upload this to YouTube uh, after this broadcast is done because YouTube takes another couple hours before it takes the live stream and makes it available. So I'll get that done as soon as I can. Thanks again for watching. Catch you next week. Next week, by the way, you're gonna, uh, um, we're going to hear from the naked pastor, David Hayward. Oh, good good so, old David. Say hi. I will. And so we're going to have a chat with him uh, next week. So. All right. Catch y'all then. All right. Please. It looks like it's not. There we go. No longer live. I'll turn this uh, end off.